here. So in the remaining of the session, we'll focus on solar technologies and the use of solar technologies for fecal sludge management. Um, I'll go right and because we're a little bit behind. Um, our first speaker is Michael Hoffman. Michael is the James Irvine Professor of Environmental Science and Engineering at the California Institute of Technology. He's an elected member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering. He's also a Global Vision Scholar at the Sigma University in Beijing. Uh, his presentation will provide an update on the Caltech solar toilet system as it transitions into manufacturing and advanced prototype development. And I forgot to introduce myself. Let me do that too. My name is Paula Ermitter. Uh, I'm a professor and computer research chair at Carlton University in Canada. And I'm also the chair of the IWA Sludge Management. Water tank, which is located above, 
uh, water is pumped up uh, and then processed through a sequential electrochemical processing. It's essentially applying uh, what we call water splitting using semiconductor electrode systems uh, to uh, basically tear apart water. We also oxidize chloride uh, to chlorine at very low applied potentials, and chlorine plays a very big role in processing the waste. So you can see the uh, effluent uh, from the anaerobic digester, about 50% of the COD is uh, decomposed uh, within the uh, membrane uh, digester system. You see particles that are still uh, suspended in the water and the color is brown. This is the second stage uh, and after a given treatment time, which is about uh, two and a half to three hours, uh, the water is then uh, pumped back through a filter system into the flush water tank. Roughly 100 students use the toilet facility on a daily basis. Uh, based on the counting, uh, maybe only 10 to 15 actually contribute feces. Uh, it's mainly a spot for uh, urination. One of my colleagues from Chinhua is uh, shown here uh, after uh, using uh, the toilet. We also have uh, prototypes that are being tested uh, in India now set the stage. Uh, the prototype that we displayed in New Delhi at the toilet fair uh, last March that is shown here. This is now situated uh, in the state of Kerala in southwestern uh, India, in the southernmost the most state of uh, India at Mahatma Gandhi University. Here it is located uh, at the university. Once again, uh, anywhere from 100 to 150 students use the a toilet on a daily basis. Uh, the contribution of feces is quite low. Uh, that's what we've found so far in operation uh, in the field at Caltech, where our prototype has been um, operating now for essentially two years. Uh, many more uh, students and faculty actually contribute their feces. But the problem in India is that people are reluctant to use the so-called public toilet uh, in the same way so far uh, in China. So the water is uh, processed on a daily basis. It, it's all safe to uh, self-contained. We don't discharge uh, any water uh, to the environment. Water is lost to uh, evaporation in the system, and we maintain a pretty good steady state. We have another uh, treatment unit in operation uh, in Ahmedabad, uh, in Gujarat State, in uh, a city park, in collaboration with uh, Ibram, and that collaboration is Continuing. One thing we noticed, uh, once again, in Ahmedabad, uh, mainly urine is contributed to the toilet system, but we also found in India uh, that men and other users, women I suppose, we, we don't keep track of the numbers, uh, actually wash their feet with this anal washing spray guns that we uh, provided uh, in uh, each unit. So the uh, units in India for the toilet room look like this. These are polar products that are, are made for the uh, Indian market. You can see the uh, anal washing flushing device. Uh, we installed uh, a, a flush toilet, uh, but because of the uh, pumping system that we use, we use a sound flow system that grinds up uh, any of the solids, so all the solids come out as a light particle uh, suspension. We also have a pump a day uh, for uh, treating uh, the backside. Now, in the uh, current uh, Chinese prototype system uh, that we uh, will soon have in operation on the uh, Tsinghua campus, uh, we essentially have the toilet, the fecal collection box, uh, a Santa Flow uh, macerating pump system into the folded plate uh, anaerobic uh, digester. It's a membrane-supported anaerobic digester. Uh, the effluent from the digester uh, characteristic uh, resonance time in the system, uh, then uh, moves on to the regulation tank, which I showed uh, in the uh, shipping container, into the electrochemical reactor sequence. Uh, we have capacity for th three sequential electrochemical uh, reactors. Uh, you can see the uh, reactors on display here without uh, wastewater in them. They depend on mixed metal oxide semiconductors. Uh, and we get very high efficiency in terms of a 
conversion of COD, production of chlorine, and disinfection of the waste. You can see uh, some of the waste uh, shown here in the processor uh, during treatment. You see a lot of bubbles because we generate hydrogen uh, as a useful uh, byproduct. Uh, the microorganisms are killed off in about uh, three hours of uh, processing. We see E. coli, uh, enteriococcus, adenovirus, uh, and uh, phage are killed off uh, within a, a reasonable uh, length of treatment time, roughly around 60 minutes uh, to eliminate the organisms. We're also developing uh, prototypes with the Kohler Company in the U.S. for single-family uh, usage, uh, so the scale is uh, reduced uh, to satisfy the needs of the single-family, but the concept uh, is very uh, similar. We also developed uh, electronic control systems to replace uh, the Chinese version, which goes from floor to ceiling. Uh, our electronic <coughs> control system that keeps everything uh, operating is in uh, a little black box, which you can see inside the black box here, and we call it the Caltech wastewater uh, treatment power supply and control system. Manufacturing uh, is underway. This is the manufacturing uh, complex that will soon go online for the entire system. We've developed a modular design and an IKEA-like uh, structure system that can be assembled in the field, everything installed, uh, so it's a prefab uh, construction idea uh, to simplify assembly in the field and transportation, some idea how you can uh, piece it together. Uh, if you have trouble uh, reading the IKEA instructions, uh, you may have trouble here too. Uh, but it can be folded down, and so we can have essentially four units stored in one international shipping container. We have a variety of other options. Uh, sorry this is uh, in uh, Chinese, but there are many configurations that uh, are uh, being offered. I conclude here uh, with uh, reference to a recent article that's soon to appear uh, in environmental science and technology, and it points out how many valuable metals are present in sewage sludge. And they point out, at least in the US, based on a city of, of one million people, the value of the combined average content of gold and silver in sewage sludge uh, equals 2.6 million a year. So uh, the gold color uh, in the sewer. I'll conclude there, but that gives you a brief uh, overview where we are. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions? There's maybe four or two questions. Yes, please. Thank you very much for a brilliant presentation. My name is Stefan from Borda. I would like to know about the uh, investment and depreciation. How long time do you think such a system should be going until it pays back, or where are we with the investment costs compared to other systems? Okay, uh, we have things uh, calibrated uh, on a 10 or 20 year period of uh, time. The major uh, operating uh, expenses uh, are uh, essentially replacement of the batteries. So if we get higher energy density uh, storage uh, batteries like lithium metal batteries that can be recharged, uh, then the battery replacement costs uh, come way down. Now that's the main uh, driver on uh, operational costs, in fact. Uh, in terms of uh, taking a prototype, a one-off prototype, and trying to scale what it's going to be at large-scale production, that's, that's very hard to do right now. I can tell you uh, that uh, one of my colleagues who uh, actually produces uh, commercially uh, the semi semiconductor electrodes that we've uh, designed uh, over the years, uh, he can, if we order 60 electrode arrays, he reduces the price in half. So the volume uh, of production is a very critical factor in terms of uh, potential payback and what the overall cost of the unit are, may be. Uh, we're shooting certainly for something less than $15,000. We think we can build a uh, 
let's say, a simplified system for, uh, let's say, $5,000 right now. But it wouldn't be as well integrated as the system we're showing here. If you're doing such Okay, we've been operating for two years. We have no net accumulation of sludge. We have uh, an ongoing digestion problem uh, or process that takes place. Uh, we have a sludge bed that's constant in a 2,000 liter storage tank that's roughly that deep uh, over time. We do produce inorganic deposition products. Uh, calcium hydroxyapatite is the major product. Because we denitrify the system, we have breakpoint chlorination during the process. So we totally eliminate nitrate. So we don't get struvite formation. We actually get hydroxyapatite formation because with continuous recycle, the phosphate builds up in the system until the solubility product constant is exceeded and it precipitates uh, out. So eventually we have to unload the hydroxyapatite, which is a major component of our bones and teeth, as you may know. But it could be a potential fertilizer. Who does the maintenance of these systems? <laughs> well, uh, we're not at full scale uh, continuous operation, but right now uh, the students uh, at Mahatma Gandhi University and then their students uh, at the uh, IIT Khan Hinagar, uh, they keep track of the unit uh, along with uh, Iran. Uh, in the Medabot. Uh, in terms of the Yixing unit, it's the local company that uh, keep tra keeps track of the unit. Uh, the new unit going in at uh, Beijing University, which is a multi-person uh, system, uh, will be maintained by the uh, department uh, uh, on the Jinghua campus. Thank you. Thank you. So we all move, we need to move to the next speaker. Access. 
Um, so we've, we've taken all those things into account to try and remember how the pollution work. But basically, it depends on uh, looking at the communal pollution system that is serviced by a community member who acts as a micro entrepreneur. Um, and it's a cartridge based system, a CBS type system. So the communal pollution block, um, the sludge removal is via cartridges. Uh, and then the challenge then is to firstly pasteurize the sludge and then actually make it a viable, saleable product for the entrepreneur so that the revenue is not based on the toilet usage but on a product that's beneficiated out of the sludge removal process. Um, and, and because these communities are really off the grid, um, we, you know, the last speaker, we're, we're completely the other party end of the spectrum. There's actually no technology involved in this um, because of the issue of maintenance um, and services for that technology. It just cannot happen out in some of these rural areas. Um, they are hundreds of kilometers away from the nearest town um, or, or, or center that could possibly supply with parts, electronics, replacement components, etc. Um, so I'll get back to this point in just now. But uh, the first part, so the first part of the process is to provide um, communal pollution blocks. And as I said, some of the topography in rural South Africa, which the Eastern Cape, um, is such that you can't take containers on flatbed trucks. So we've a team up with a company and started with the US uh, shelters. Basically they ship uh, a system like this in a, in a box and it takes four community members one day to rent the system. So they're quite interested in, in developing this into an evolution facility because while you have homes that can look like this, you know, the evolution system is fast and comes in. Um, so essentially, the evolution system is a converted boat shelter. Um, access to the toilet cartridge is from the rear by the community member who is the micro entrepreneur. Um, and we've had to look at the toilet uh, and redesigned that. Um, which can still in the process of doing that design and manufacture. But essentially, the cartridge has got two, two systems. One where the, the slash is connected, and the system here that locks into the um, ventilation system. The cartridge systems, and then a couple of people I spoke with here, cartridge systems are problematic because of the odor situation. They don't work like VIPs. So we've tried to integrate that process so that just like a VIP, um, the odors are sucked out of the evolution facility. Um, once that's been removed, uh, the, the issue is what do you do with that sludge? Um, the, the, the key challenge is that in the middle of nowhere, you can't just bury the sludge because what we're trying to do is provide a model when that sludge becomes a value add product. So, the first thing that's, that's a critical system, uh, uh, process in, this, in the chain is to pasteurize and integrate all the pathogens. And in order to do that, uh, Africa does not have a shortage of sun. So we're going back to using solar power, but instead of the solar panel type system, we two batteries and electrical circuitry. Uh, we're looking at the concentrated solar power using parabolic troughs. Now these work at scale all over the world. There, there are huge um, fields of these things. Um, they work well, they get to see these changes. We're not going to go into the details. So what we did was we miniaturized that. Um, and we stuck it onto the back of a bicycle trailer. So basically the entrepreneur owns this trailer. Um, you can see the cartridge there. It's a normal bicycle wheel, 26 inch long, quite well. Um, and that can be tagged onto the back of a bicycle and driven around uh, a rural community area. And um, you know, it's not limited by the topography as well. Um, once the, the entrepreneur uh, is ready to use the system, the panels unfold, um, and the way the concentrated solar power works, the parabolic trough, is this is all reflected, sunlight is reflected onto a focal band. And the focal band is where we put the sludge in. So the sludge goes through here, um, and then decides, pasteurizes the sludge while it's passing through the system. Um, does it work? We've burned ourselves many times, it gets incredibly hot. But does it 
that's not working out to pass your isolation. And that's the next big challenge. So what we based it on is as Chris death, heal, thermal death, point. We're looking at between 60 and 90 degrees. Right? We need to get the system operating there. Um, and these are two uh, graphs showing a normal daily operation. Um, and these are thermal couples that we put on the, the concentrated tube where the sludge passes through. These two graphs don't have sludge in them, but they give you a, a representation or baseline of what can happen um, on a normal day. And um, this, this is ambient temperature here, normal day by 25 degrees. Yeah. And in that time, we've got a lot of strong wind. Uh, so we can't cover. So we have to test the system to see if uh, the tube can still uh, remain a temperature above the thermal end point for customers. Thank you very much. 
do this for, sorry, my name is Jacques Rust from Embarrassment in South Africa. Um, to make this viable option for the, um, both the user and for the um, entrepreneur on the cartridge side of it, how um, long does it take to fill the cartridge in a household to stand in South Africa, say about six people? And so on that question, what type um, of monetary will be paid to the entrepreneur for emptying the cartridge by the owner? Right, that's a good question. Um, we haven't sized the final cartridge volume yet. And the reason for that is the reason for that is that we're optimizing the throughput on the solar barometer system. So once we've we've optimized that we'll be able to size the system. Um, because it doesn't help that the micro entrepreneur can only prioritize one cartridge a day. So that's going to be dependent on, on feedback from, from when we finalize the evaluation process. Once you've got the evacuation tube in the system, uh, we can reach high temperatures to achieve paralysis, um, which is about three or four hundred degrees. Uh, we'll be able to figure out the throughput and then size it accordingly and work backwards um, in terms of the design process. One other question. One more question. Okay, so thank you to me. Our next speaker is Dr. Carlin Dunn, who is the Helena Hubercroft and our professor of environmental engineering at the University of Colorado Boulder in the USA. And he was my postdoc supervisor at Duke. Um, his research focuses on next generation innovative water and wastewater treatment solutions. He is currently leading a team developing sanitation solutions as part of the Gates Foundation Reimagined Toilet Challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Manu. Thanks to the first two speakers uh, set up my talk quite well. Um, our approach to toilet design is again to kind of eliminate the sludge production and produce a biochar product, produce a useful end product on site in real time throughout the day, throughout the days of processing. I want to first acknowledge our team. We uh, were funded a year after uh, Mike's team from Caltech. We've been, again, going from a paper concept you know, to, to an operating unit in about a year and a half or two years was an incredible journey. But a lot of people made that happen, these folks here. And since since then, uh, we've been partnering the last month and a half or so with a company in Boulder called Brightspace, who really brought some of the technologies we were developing to another level and helped to really decrease our cost. I'm looking forward to developing a further system, which I'll talk to you about today as well. And some of this work by Brightspace is funded by the Department of Energy, so they're really interested in some of the technologies there. They put quite a bit of money into this, and of course, thanks to the Gates Foundation for funding this work. So as we saw before, there's, there's concentrated solar energy come basically in three types. There's a this, uh, parabolic trough here, there's this uh, concentrated uh, dish, and then there's this tower system where it's a receiver from many different uh, reflectors can be uh, received and, and the, the energy concentrated. We're focusing on this type of design in our next phase, looking at both of these as, as kind of a hybrid system for processing uh, fecal sludge. So our system is called the Sol Char Toilet because it uses solar energy and produces a char product in the end. This is the phase one uh, development of, this, of the unit we have as a research unit to prove our concepts. Again, we're coming from a, an idea on paper that, that we've never been done before. So our concept basically takes concentrated solar energy, concentrates that energy to a point and reflects it back down into a receiver. And at that receiver point, we have a bundle of, of cables that transmit the light to another location. And that's kind of the key technology innovation we developed. It took us quite a while to develop that because we fried a lot of fiber optic cables and learning about how, how to do this and create a lot of strong energy transmission. So we have this, these dishes that concentrate energy. The fiber optics transmit the energy to a reaction chamber where the feces is from the day's collection and it processes that waste by paralyzing it, which is a you know, low oxygen environment under uh, high temperature conditions. And the temperatures we've been able to achieve in our system are over 300 degrees Celsius uh, during the peak of the day. So we were able to paralyze the human waste and produce a char product. And then we've done a lot of research on what we do with that char. We've made briquettes, we've characterized the briquette uh, calorific content, we've looked at off-gas issues, uh, looked at issues around using that biochar in agriculture as well, how will they, they sequester nutrients or provide uh, benefits there. 
And all this time, you know, our, our mantra has been with the Gates Foundation that has kind of set up as this high level treatment, uh, treatment goal of using no water, no grid electricity, no external inputs, and only, uh, you know, produces nice and fire product that could be useful. So we had a bunch of advantages and a bunch of disadvantages in our phase one. The advantages were that we have a solar based design. We had this fiber optic concept. The fiber optic concept basically allows us to, to remove the, you know, the fecal material from this area of the concentrator and bring it to a different area and allow light to come to that area. And so we have this reaction system, it's hard to see right here, but these fiber optic cables come here and they, they basically heat up this chamber, you can see the light there uh, to a very high temperature. And the hardest thing is to drive off the water content, so we, we have a urine to toilet as well as part of our system. Um, we had a batch design in our initial design. We're looking at a continuous design system now. And again, our end products are this char. We're able to disinfect urine in a separate module using some excess heat. Uh, and the excess heat can also be used to heat water for either water purification or for um, home heating. So we had a lot of challenges as well. Um, most of our, our costs in our system are due to the transmission. The fiber optic cables were very, very expensive when we started. We got them down about 90% to about 10% of the original cost, but that still was a big chunk of our cost. And then the solar capture was also a big chunk of our cost, and we didn't have a commercialization process in place. But we did improve our system, so what we set out to do. We estimated the production scale cost of the current unit that we were doing in phase one was about $12,000, which was too high for, our, for eventually rolling a lot of these out. So the high cost of the concentrated the transmission, and we designed the system to serve a household, so about six to 10 people initially. And the economics there is very hard to make the economics work. As many of the toilet teams know, it's hard to make the economics work to reach the goal of five cents per person per day when you're only serving eight to 10 people a day. Um, so we need to make a bigger system that serve more people. Then, of course, with any solar system, it's hard to treat the waste when there's no sun. So we have to come up with something that dealt with that issue. And then some of the durability and security concerns, you know, we have these shiny disks that for sure will get stolen somehow or Somehow we'll walk away, um, and then what if someone throws rocks at this thing or, or you know, other components like that? So those are all issues that we have to deal with. So that's where this company, Brightspace, comes in, and, and it's really another level working with a, a company that's already in commercialization for technologies. But we're used to doing things in the laboratory, making prototypes, not really building something, but actually build something to another, another scale. So the issue of the high cost of solar transmission, Brightspace has uh, a different type of fiber optic technology that's really reduced our cost by 10 times uh, over uh, under our initial uh, cost we've been doing. They also have a different technology for the solar capture. Um, their collection area is a lot more compact. Uh, their tracker system is a little bit different than what we're doing. And their collectors actually use uh, high volume commercial processing for making these collectors. We made all of ours custom, obviously, in our initial. The system also can serve more people. The higher density pack in solar, we can get up to 100 people per day in a certain design with a shipping container type design. I'll we'll talk about that in a minute. And then the main innovation that the DOE, the Department of Energy in the US, is interested in because they have this co generation technology where they take the solar energy, split it up, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and produce electricity as well as producing this heat and sunlight. And then we're working on the durability and security concerns by redesigning the way the system looks. Uh, so I'll look through these. Um, so, yeah, so here's the, the technology that really excited to the DOE that this company Brightspace has been working on commercializing now. They take the solar spectrum, which is, consists of visible light and infrared light, and they have an infrared photovoltaic system that has about 20 to 25% efficiency converting sunlight in the infrared range into electricity. And then they split, they split this off into the generation of electricity, and then we can also utilize the light that we were utilizing in the beginning, this visible light for the high temperature transmission through the fiber optics. So with these two things, we have a lot of value now added in the next generation system that we're looking to, to develop. So the, the DNI, the direct oral insulation, um, it varies all over the world, obviously. Um, in India, um, we need DNI, let's say in our phase one, we assumed about three to four the DNI, and a lot of India, in Africa has very hot spots. Most of India has over five DNI, and a lot of Africa, like this, so I'm waiting presentation, very high in solar radiance, and also in the northern area as well. So there's a lot of areas that have plenty of solar energy to make these systems work. So as far as the cost reduction goes in the fiber optics, our phase one, um, we have about a six, $6 uh, per watt type of uh, cost here. 
much lower here than 10, 10 times uh, efficiency the new system. And then the solar capture is about four to eight times lower in cost as well. So we really see our costs going down based on our, our initial designs here with this uh, bright space company. And then as far as power delivery goes, uh, this graph goes through a number of things going on to point out is the total system uh, peak fiber power delivery. Uh, with our system, we have about 750 watts, and we can get almost three to 5,000 watts, depending on how many solar collectors we have. That's a lot of energy to deal with and, and to use. Total energy delivered is almost, could be up to 170 uh, megajoules. And then the, the cost of their system is much lower. And this is the cost for the shipping container and all the solar components. We estimate less than two cents per person per day, depending upon the, the solar insulation being used. And the nice thing, we have this electricity generation as well about five kilowatt hours per day or 10 kilowatt hours per day, depending on the system. So looking at the various levels of DNI, you can predict um, and model how, much, how many people we can serve, um, what the cost is, and the electricity generated. This is a small system scenario where we have a shipping container with about 24 solar collectors and a larger one with about 48. Um, and you can see the, the numbers here, very, very low cost per person. You can cheat up to 100 person's waste and produce almost 15 uh, kilowatt hours per day of electricity. So with our phase two approach, we hope to design a system around this uh, shipping container kind of design like you've seen a few times you saw it in the Caltech presentation. And we can really go to different levels. Ultimately, we want to go to chart, but it's a lot cheaper, obviously, if we just want to disinfect the waste or we just want to dry the waste. This is where we'd like to also collaborate with a number of other folks working on solar issues or, or maybe that could benefit from solar issues that are using a, a burning process or a paralysis process and they need to dry their sludge out uh, to a level that makes it more efficient. So in this kind of level one, we can have disinfected fecal sludge, which will be a lot smaller system. And in treatment level two, we can have a dry sludge which we can reuse. And in level three, which is what we'd like to do, is, is create this biochar and create a product that can potentially be sold that can be made into briquettes. And certainly all, all these systems will also be able to disinfect the urine and produce um, uh, stabilized end product. So this, we're thinking about a business model as well, um, you know, generating electricity, providing heat, heating up water for shower perhaps, we're having kind of a village center, a community center, a toilet area, also a place to charge cell phones, we have a lot of excess electricity, we're going to need some of that electricity to move the feces around in our system, to move the parts around, but we'll have excess electricity to provide for uses in the community. And this size provides a little bit of momentum and, and allowing a lot of people to use the system and having maybe some credits to you know, reap some of the electricity benefits uh, from their own personal use. So that's our vision right now. We're looking for uh, partners. We're looking for folks to, to work with us. Um, Brightspace is a great partner, and uh, we're hoping to be developing our new system over the next few months and looking for places to work in the field. So hope to talk to some of you folks here. Thanks a lot for your attention. Mr. Reddy, uh, you mentioned about 
for the operate, operating guidelines uh, in Tamil Nadu. Uh, these are for uh, design and construction of septic tanks. So, are these guidelines are just for new uh, construction of new septic tanks, or uh, what you are going to do about the old or already built septic tanks which are not functional or which are oversized or undersized? <coughs> Is any uh, procedure for the same? But uh, both. For the old, uh, we need to do a survey to find out which are uh, the exaggerated entrance and the septic tanks and uh, give notices to those households to get them rectified. And for the new ones, in any case, we are giving this uh, design. Uh, we have to follow that design. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Sanjeev, you Thank you all for the nice presentations. My name is Anna Kennedy from Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. I want to address a question to the last two toilet interventions. Like the concept is to not have any energy inputs, external energy inputs, but have you thinking about uh, making life cycle analysis to see how much energy input that is needed for these components? Because we don't know much about the manufacturing side yet, it's hard to do that in the initial phase, but certainly that is the analysis that has to get done. Uh, the whole life cycle analysis input, you know, that carbon footprints and things like that. So that's something we definitely want to do. I mean, there's benefits to having no external energy inputs, but those are offset by you know, the high cost of components, obviously it would be a valuable product. It's a great point. Um, our, I think our biggest challenge is social acceptance. <coughs> and it was as well with the charge used for cooking. Um, that's one of the biggest cultural hurdles. Um, the way we've addressed that is whilst we've introduced the stove community, which uses conventional biomass, which is technical. Um, stove design is what we see at the moment working with. If the biochar from the sludge is used, we can use that to heat water, which can be run externally to the house. The house. So those are the kind of challenges that we also have to work with. Yeah, to that point, we did bring some human fecal biochar to the India Fair. We, we cooked with it on site and fed some of the workers roasted peanuts and things like that. They, they were sure it didn't take it, it didn't taste anything like poop, so that was good. It didn't uh, this is sort of a general question, I guess, to the, the very good toilet, the, the toilet talks. Um, the initial design parameters for the gates said no water in, no, or only clean water out. But that's the neglect the, or doesn't account for the need for hand washing and hygiene that needs to occur at toilets. And so now that the scope is broadening a little bit, when you're thinking about installations that provide multiple services, I'm wondering if um, what the role of hand washing station is and if that's changed the way that you're thinking about the design of the toilets as well. In, in our case, uh, it's actually the uh, recycled uh, water that comes out of the faucet. Uh, because it's uh, chlorinated, uh, it's disinfected. Uh, a problem in India uh, was pointed out that uh, a lot of Indians, when they go in, want to wash their face with the uh, sink water. So we probably have to have some notification of that. Uh, you know, be careful. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's essentially disinfected. It looks clear. Uh, and with uh, soap, it, it, it's uh, equally suitable. Um, and, you know, the question is long-term uh, exposure. Uh, I, I don't think it should be a problem, but uh, it, you know, it's hard to predict at this point in time. But we're uh, all set up for uh, diverting a certain fraction of the water to hand washing. Uh, one more point about that: we also have in our system we design for hand washing. Disinfect, we mix that with the urine and disinfect that off the closed loop modular system. 
just an yeah. asterisk, and then you can reuse that in urine mixture, diluted urine for hopefully something beneficial. I like this high tech news, but my fear is or my concern is like if you put a high tech blue into a um, area with low education people, um, the nitrogen's might be difficult. Also, it's no ownership. If there's something in place, then, then the people they, they have no ownership. Uh, from a manufacturer point, it's smart to build it and then sell it on to your revenue stream for the other units you sell. Could it be an option to have the toilet built in the location according to the cultural and social demand or whatever people would like to, to choose for a toilet and then have a semi-decentralized treating unit maybe per block or um, instead of having it on any unit so you need a don't need a PhD to operate it and you maintain it? So there's an issue with taking the waste out from one location and bringing it to a centralized facility to treat it there. So you have to have a container system, which does exist, and we've seen a lot of this at this meeting. So that's a definitely a way to go and then keep things a lot, a lot more simple, less moving parts. But you know, we're definitely envisioning a maintenance person being used in our system as, as is the Caltech system. Um, and you need, you need human input. You need, there's no system that works without someone working in even our toilets, we flush them, but there's a lot of people behind that, that wall that take care of the, the waste. It's just, you know, there's no one single ideal situation. We can uh, control our unit uh, on a smartphone, uh, so we get signals when uh, one component that may not be functioning in the way it should. Uh, we can uh, change the coding uh, on the initial uh, setup from afar, so we've actually recoded the Indian prototypes from California. Uh, we can do it by SMS or smartphone. Um, it was pointed out that there are more smartphones or more cell phones in India than uh, toilets. Uh, so people can maintain a smartphone, and you don't need a PhD to operate a smartphone, and that's pretty clear. So all you need to do is use one of these to make it operate. And then change, they'll tell you what needs to be changed, and uh, it's not too difficult to do that. So, we have one last question before we go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Timmy Kwan from Asian Human Bank. I'm very interested about the project of uh, Professor Hoffman presented. Uh, just a question uh, Is this toilet uh, able to deal with uh, the toilet paper? But, uh, uh, you said basically there's no. Uh, no solid waste come out coming out from the system. And also the second, uh, we, we, we saw this uh, membrane used uh, to, uh, to clean up the water. So the cost of the membrane and also the replacement of the membrane is that included in the routine operation. Yeah. And the third part, uh, we can see it's a factor this is the implicated one. Uh, is, is this uh, uh, toilet related to any kind of uh, Okay, there, there are three parts. Uh, the first part is uh, toilet paper. That's why we have the uh, anal washing uh, devices. Uh, you probably know from Southeast Asia and India uh, that anal washing is, is quite common. Uh, even here in the hotels, there is a little spray gun that you can use to do most of the, the heavy cleaning and then uh, just a few dabs uh, to dry off uh, with toilet paper. And we have uh, containers that open and shut automatically and you put the toilet paper in. We can certainly handle toilet paper. You'd like to uh, avoid it and hope that people use uh, the uh, sort of pump the day or the handle spray washing system to do the usual uh, cleanup so you aren't too dependent a lot of toilet paper. Um, if, let's see, number two was uh, a membrane. So, but they're just polystyrene noodles. Uh, so it's, it's not a membrane, you know, inexpensive membrane sheet. It's just a support system for biofilm growth. Uh, 
Uh, so it, we're using a high-tech name membrane biomimicry, but it's really just a, a series of uh, polystyrene noodles uh, suspended the, into the reactor system. And it's kind of cheating calling it a baffled reactor, but essentially it's like a curtain of, of polystyrene noodles that are incredibly cheap. It's like uh, packing uh, popcorn that people use routinely, but it's just in noodle form. Yeah, patents, uh, uh, the Gates Foundation stresses IP, uh, and uh, we have uh, a variety of, of patents that have been uh, processed, uh, but we have to have global access uh, for uh, basically uh, manufacturing and uh, production. Uh, so the Gates Foundation has thought of all those uh, complexities, and, and unless you have patent coverage on a global basis, anybody can reproduce the system by reverse uh, engineering. Uh, it's uh, mainly an issue in, in Europe and the United States. It's hard to uh, control things in, in Korea, China, or uh, elsewhere. So, uh, but we'll see how far that goes. But we, we do license the uh, technology. But it has to be open for it. Thank you. I would like to thank all of our speakers.